Army Private Bradley Manning has been imprisoned for over 1,000 days on charges that he leaked classified information to Julian Assange's website, WikiLeaks. And today, Manning pled guilty to 10 of the 22 counts that he was charged with, excluding the most serious of violating the Espionage Act and aiding the enemy. But there is a lot more to this story, of course, than meets the eye. Turns out Manning had contacted a number of major media outlets first. So joining us now to discuss, we've got Kevin Gostola, journalist that's covered WikiLeaks at Fire Dog Lake in Washington, D.C., and HuffPost national reporter Matt Sledge joining us from New York. So hi, guys. Hey, guys. Hey. Hey. Uh, Kevin, why don't we start with you? You've been at, at all of these pretrial hearings for Bradley Manning thus far, and maybe you can just kind of break it down for us. I know that today he got into some of the motives as to why it is that he did hand over this information and, uh, you know, and, and what he thought that it could achieve. What he was doing was presenting a voluntary statement. It was about 35 pages long. He read it for over an hour. And this was what he typed up while he was in confinement at, at Fort Leavenworth. He pre prepared it because he wanted to give the judge background on why he had committed the offenses that he was pleading guilty to committing. And what was remarkable from a journalistic standpoint perhaps even for people who are supporters of Bradley Manning, was that for the first time, Manning was laying out exactly why uh, he made these choices to disclose the information and give it to WikiLeaks. And then, Kevin, too, could you also break down for us? So he did plead guilty to 10 of the charges uh, of the 22. Let's say that those that he did plead guilty to are all that he has to do jail time for. How much time are we talking about? The maximum punishment uh, would be 21 years. Kevin, let me jump in and ask you about uh, uh, Manning talking about reaching out to these uh, mainstream uh, publications. He talked about the New York Times. He talked about Politico. He talked about the Washington Post. What did he say about the forms of correspondence that he used and the responses that he got from these news outlets before going to WikiLeaks? Bradley says that he talked to a woman at the Washington Post and... The person on the other end seemed to be um, not taking him seriously, was, was disinterested, and uh, so that became a dead end. Uh, he said that this was a local newspaper because he was staying with his aunt and he wanted to disclose it there. Uh, he ended up contacting the New York Times, and I think he left a message for the public editor. Um, at least that's how it appears because uh, the Huffington Post, you know, you, uh, Michael Calderon has been covering uh, that angle. And uh, so he never got anything back, even though he left his email address and a Skype address. So it was perfectly possible for somebody to contact him. Um, and then he never actually made contact with Politico. So I should clarify that. It might be a slight correction. He couldn't go to the office because Washington, D.C. was getting hit by a major blizzard. And Matt, how do you think that we should, uh, you know, interpret all of this? Some people are saying, well, leaving a voicemail with the New York Times means that you really didn't try hard enough to get a hold of somebody, um, you know, or, or is this an example really where you did see some of the major news organizations ignoring it? Or do they get calls like this all the time? They get calls like this all the time. Uh, you know, the public editor apparently gets uh, dozens of calls a day. And, uh, you know, one of the uh, New, York's New York Times editor estimated that they get hundreds, maybe even a thousand calls or emails like this. Well, not necessarily like this today. Um, uh, you know, I, I think the journalistic sin uh, still remains to be seen because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Kevin, we don't know exactly what kind of messages he was leaving with these people. Uh, my two cents is it seems like he, he, he could have pushed a little bit harder with the news agencies, although the ultimate result of that would have been very different because uh, I, I don't think any of the papers would ever have published the files in bulk the way WikiLeaks did. And yeah, Kevin, I'm, w I'm wondering what you think about that, too. Let's say that The New York Times and The Washington Post had got their hands on this would you know would it have turned out uh the same way and would we have seen a massive prosecution like this right uh if he's handing the information over to wikileaks rather than the new york times i think that that's a key point to make is that the washington post or the new york times would not have published all of the war logs like wikileaks i'm a le I'm, I'm less um 
gen generous towards how the Washington Post or New York Times handled Bradley Manning's communications as he, as he described. I, I'm less generous because they have a track record of sitting on stories uh, like the Bush warrantless wiretapping story, uh, like the Saudi drone base, the secret Saudi Arabia drone base, um, and that they have been pretty deferential, that they failed to critically report on the march to go to war in Iraq. So I think that what Bradley Manning experienced is about a, is you know indicative of the U.S. press in general, and he ultimately found that it was best to just submit to WikiLeaks because WikiLeaks wasn't going to decide whether it was right to publish or not. They would accept his submission either way. And so, what do you think uh, happens next in terms of those the heavier charges when it comes to counts of violating the Espionage Act, of aiding the enemy? Uh, you know, is uh, what is the prosecution really going to have to prove there? What happens going forward is that the government proceeds on to trial. What they have to do is prove the elements that he didn't plead guilty. What we have to see them prove is that he did release what is called, quote, national defense information. We also have to see them prove um, that he was stealing the information and that he violated the Espionage Act and that his act was exceeding authorized access on a computer. This all goes to the federal charges. What will happen is the judge will determine whether she finds him guilty of the lesser offenses he pled to or if she finds him guilty of all the originally charged major misconduct. There is no scenario here where Bradley Manning is found not guilty. So we can realistically say in this conversation, Bradley Manning is going to jail. What we don't know is how long. We know a max punishment of 21 years with the lesser offenses or life in prison without parole, potentially, if he's convicted of aiding the enemy. So that's the range. And Matt, you know, one of the things, too, uh, you know, that, that Manning did say today was that he hoped, uh, you know, felt that maybe releasing this information could spark a domestic debate on the role of the military, our foreign policy. He thought it might cause society to reevaluate the need to engage in counterterrorism or counterinsurgency operations. Do you think any of that's been achieved at this point? <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, I think not. Uh, you know, I, I, we are slowly getting out of Afghanistan and people seem happy with that. Uh, but there's no sign that we're letting up on drones or any number of uh, surveillance or counterterrorism programs. And there's no sign that uh, the public at large is really concerned about them. Um, so uh, I, I think uh, the, the impact on the American public of the WikiLeaks revelations was rather limited. Uh, around the world, the impact was a little bit different. And by the way, I have the, the exact statement too that I was just saying is that I believe that if the general public had access to the information, like I said, this could spark a debate as the role of the military and foreign policy in general. And it was a 35 page statement, uh, Kevin, as you mentioned that he didn't read out there, but he said, I felt I accomplished something that would allow me to have a clear conscience. And this was the type of information that should become public. And so, you know, I guess once again, then when we talk about Bradley Manning uh, in the role of, of a whistleblower and someone that was aware of what he was putting out there and felt that there was a reason for it, you know, that this statement really does uh, just clear all that up. So Kevin and Matt, thank you guys so much for, for joining us and give us, giving us the latest updates on this. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jacob. You got it, Alona. Been a pleasure. Always. All right, guys, stick around. A lot more Hub Post Live coming up.